what calling uh, forced mobility, while uh, dozens of thousands of trans migrants uh, from uh, Central America uh, remained stuck in uh, Mexico. A good example of forced uh, immobility. Uh, hygienic uh, sanitary border enforcement uh, have been enacted to increase uh, deterrence in many parts of the world, including uh, Europe. And border crossing in general has become even more difficult and risky in the last months as the increase in the number of shipwrecks in the Mediterranean demonstrates. The hardening of borders uh, has been uh, a general uh, trend in the last years. A trend that uh, has been exacerbated uh, in the wake uh, of the crisis, of the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, with the rise uh, of uh, new nationalist forces uh, of the right, just think uh, of Brexit, and in particular in Europe, uh, in the wake of uh, what uh, critical migration scholars and activists call the long summer of migration in 2015. Walls have uh, proliferated. Physical walls, like the one between Mexico and the US, but also metaphoric walls, like the ones of uh, Fortress uh, Europe. And walls have uh, captured the critical imagination. This is, of course, uh, an important uh, trend that uh, we need to analyze uh, in detail. Nevertheless, I have to say that uh, I agree with uh, Wendy Brown, uh, who uh, explained uh, some years ago that this proliferation of walls uh, is more a symptom of crisis than uh, of a statement uh, of uh, sovereignty. Uh, and this uh, for uh, several reasons. Uh, among them, the fact that uh, contemporary nation states need to manage mobility. Mobility can be managed in a selective and violently hierarchical way, but uh, it is very difficult to stop them because uh, contemporary capitalism is uh, predicated upon specific forms of mobility of uh, labor. In the first decade of uh, the 21st century, we were confronted with uh, the emergence of neoliberal theories and practices of migration management that precisely pointed to accomplish a differential inclusion of migrant labor. Walls do not tackle this question. Moreover, there is a need to carefully analyze also the operations of walls and other reinforcement devices within wider assemblages of power and resistance and within wider geographies. This is for me a very important point. When uh, we think of borders, the 
first image that comes uh, to our mind is the one of the line traced uh, on the map. Something uh, stable, uh, fixed. Uh, and fortified borders uh, tend to reinforce uh, the validity of such uh, image. But it is important uh, to stress that uh, contemporary borders, uh, even uh, the most fortified borders, uh, are at the same time mobile borders. And there is a need to reflect upon uh, this uh, combination of the fortification and mobility of uh, borders. Just think of the question of externalization of borders control in Europe, in the European Union, or of Mexico, a country that has been turned into what critical migration scholars in that country call a vertical border. I think the notion of uh, border regime is uh, particularly uh, apt to capture this combination of fortification and mobility of uh, borders. This notion has been particularly uh, elaborated uh, in Germany in the last 10 years by such scholars as Sabine S. and Bernd Kasparik. And the notion of border regime underscores the flexible and multi-scalar nature of border control and of its geography. Even the elusiveness of border control and its geography an elusiveness which does not at all exclude punctual sovereign interventions on specific places on specific bodies. Another point that is stressed by the notion of border regime is the heterogeneity of the actors involved in border uh, controls, public and private actors. Private actors uh, like private transport companies known as uh, migration careers uh, or companies operating in the global business of security like G4S uh, play uh, very important uh, roles in the governance of borders nowadays, and they introduce onto the border regime a logic that is quite different from the classical political logic of sovereignty. Let me uh, come uh, closer to uh, the real topic of uh, this uh, talk. And let me uh, say uh, something about uh, the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has become uh, in the last years uh, the most uh, little, uh, point of border crossing in the world. Well, the combination of fortification and even militarization and mobility of borders becomes particularly apparent in the choppy waters of the Mediterranean. And note that, uh, in general, the notion and institution 
of uh, the border is constitutively linked with the land. Since uh, the mythological image of a furrow hmm, traced by a plow. Hmm. Some of you may be familiar with Carl Schmitt's theory of uh, the qualitative difference between land and sea from a legal and political point of view. It would be very interesting to go into the detail of uh, the history of uh, spatial uh, demarcations uh, across the oceans, which played uh, an outstanding role in the history of European colonial and imperial uh, expansion. There's a very nice book uh, by Lauren Benton <laughs> entitled A Search for Sovereignty <laughs> that has uh, a whole chapter on uh, the sea. Hmm? Corridors, passageways, channels, rather than uh, clear cut lines uh, of uh, demarcation emerge here. And the liquidity of uh, the sea seems even today to resist <coughs> the geometric accuracy of bordering, as the often elusive intertwining of territorial waters, uh, contiguous zones, exclusive economic zones, uh, SAR zones, and international waters uh, amply demonstrate. And nevertheless, in many parts uh, of the world, and in particular in the Mediterranean, bordering exercises are underway for the extraction of resources and above all for the management of migration. This bordering exercises are particularly interesting from the point of view uh, of uh, the geography hmm, of uh, border uh, control. Hmm. We know that uh, hmm, in the Mediterranean, somewhere uh, hmm, there is a line, and this line is uh, the external maritime frontier of the European Union. But how is uh, uh, the Mediterranean border hmm, managed? Hmm. First of all, uh, geographically, hmm, there is uh, a distinction between uh, three wide uh, areas, hmm. the Western, the Eastern, and the Central Mediterranean. And if you look at the way in which uh, these areas are controlled and governed, uh, each of them uh, points to uh, the crucially relevant role of a non-European country. Morocco, Western Mediterranean, Turkey, Eastern Mediterranean, and Libya. Central Mediterranean. These three countries are involved in the European border regime, which implies a kind of shift in the geography of. European borders. Moreover, the externalization of European border control reaches deep into sub-Saharan Africa, involving several countries in a variable geography of 
control. Hmm? So if we ask, uh, where do migrants and refugees encounter the European external border? Huh? This is a question uh, that uh, is uh, really difficult uh, to answer in a straightforward uh, way. What we definitely know is uh, the intolerable price of the operations of the European border regime in uh, the Mediterranean. Since uh, 2014, more than 20,000 uh, people died uh, in the Mediterranean, according uh, to the International uh, Organization for uh, Migration. I know that uh, such figures are well known, but I think uh, it is uh, politically and even ethically uh, necessary uh, to repeat them uh, when uh, we talk about uh, the Mediterranean. And uh, if you keep uh, such figures uh, into account, it is easy to understand uh, why the notion of uh, necropolitics that was uh, forged by Achille Mbembe several years ago circulates uh, so widely in uh, critical debates uh, on uh, border and migration uh, in uh, the Mediterranean, as well as uh, elsewhere, for instance, uh, in Mexico. Mm. A specific aspect of uh, the hardening of borders uh, in uh, recent years, uh, with uh, different degrees uh, in different countries, in different parts of the world, uh, has been the criminalization of uh, humanitarianism and uh, humanitarian intervention. Just think of the politics uh, of closed ports uh, pursued by Matteo Salvini of Italy when he was deputy prime minister in 2018-2019. Of uh, so-called crimes of solidarity in France. Of the criminalization of a group like No More Deaths in Arizona where it runs a desert medical clinic and disseminates bottles of water and food across migrants' routes in the desert. Or think of uh, growing intimidations against NGOs assisting Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and India, of the persistent administrative obstacles to search and rescue operations carried out by the ships of civil society in the Mediterranean. The list could easily go on. Humanitarian intervention is under attack in many parts of the world. It is not taken for granted that humanitarian intervention is something uh, legitimate. And this is uh, a significant shift with respect uh, to earlier years. For a relatively long time, humanitarian actors had been part of the border regime in the Mediterranean and elsewhere. Militarization and humanitarianism have indeed often intermingled in the operations of the European border regime since the early 2000s, definitely opening up contradictions and the space of, of maneuver for migrants and refugees, but also leading to what the critical scholars have often described as a governmentalization of the humanitarian reason, to quote uh, the phrase introduced by Didier Passen in a famous book. The new conjuncture of criminalization has made humanitarian intervention even more difficult and risky, often with lethal implications uh, for people in transit. 
at the same time, it has also challenged many humanitarian actors to rethink anew the very foundation of their engagement. It was precisely in this uh, uh, conjuncture uh, characterized by uh, the criminalization of uh, humanitarian intervention at sea, particularly in Italy, uh, that uh, we decided uh, to launch uh, a search and rescue project uh, in uh, June uh, 2000. Uh, 18. Hmm. Salvini had just uh, shot Italian ports to the ship Aquarius of Médecins Sans Frontières and uh, SOS Mediterranean, carrying more than uh, 600 rescued uh, migrants and refugees. Hmm. So we started to uh, discuss within a relatively small uh, group uh, of uh, activists. Hmm. And uh, uh, we had to find something, something unexpected, something nobody could expect from us. Of course, we organized uh, uh, demonstrations, uh, we wrote, uh, we wrote uh, calls and articles, but we wanted to do something more, something uh, practical, to put it simply. So we decided uh, to. Uh, search for the boat <laughs> and uh, uh, we dedicated the whole summer <laughs> to that search at the end uh, we found uh, both the boat and the money to buy it <laughs> and uh, on uh, october uh, 3 <laughs> the anniversary of uh, the shipwreck of 2013 <laughs> Our boat uh, sailed uh, for uh, its first uh, search and rescue uh, mission. Mm -hmm. In the following uh, uh, two years, uh, we have uh, accomplished uh, several missions, uh, pursuing a systematic uh, monitoring uh, activity in uh, the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. rescuing uh, several hundred. Uh, migrants uh, and uh, uh, entering uh, several clashes uh, with uh, the Italian government. If you are interested uh, uh, in the details, uh, I can say more uh, in uh, the discussion. For now, what uh, interests me more uh, is uh, the way in which uh, uh, we um, framed our uh, initiative, uh, uh, entering uh, several productive dialogues uh, with uh, humanitarian actors, uh, but uh, uh, stressing the fact that uh, uh, our initiative was not a humanitarian initiative, was not a classical humanitarian initiative. It's a kind of joke uh, we uh, uh, used to say that uh, uh, Mediterranean, the name of the initiative, uh, is not an NGO, it is rather uh, an NGA, a non-governmental action. Mm -hmm. We uh, attempted uh, to uh, promote a kind of politicization of uh, search and rescue operations promoting uh, a convergence between uh, different NGOs operating at sea. We uh, stressed the importance to build bridges between uh, the sea and the land. In a way, going beyond the classical humanitarian logic of uh, emergency intervention. The classical humanitarian logic of emergency intervention is focused on the site of emergency, in this case, on the sea. We were trying 
to develop uh, different kind of gaze, different kind of uh, action, uh, combining the uh, movements and struggles of migrants at sea with the movements and, uh, and struggles of migrants uh, on the land uh, and uh, with uh, more uh, general uh, political uh, movements uh, on the land. Mm. We developed a politics of law, mm -hmm. uh, negotiating with uh, uh, several uh, uh, levels mm, of uh, jurisdiction, but at the same time, uh, we claimed uh, the necessity to break the law when uh, it is uh, needed. Moreover, and this is maybe the most uh, important point, but I will uh, come back uh, to it in a moment. Uh, we have been, uh, since the beginning, uh, very critical uh, with the respect uh, to uh, the rhetoric of victimization that uh, characterizes uh, humanitarian. Anyway, Mediterranean is, uh, of course, part of a lively and heterogeneous spectrum of actors engaged uh, along the European border zones uh, on the land and uh, at sea in attempts to support migrants and refugees in the process of border crossing. Some of these actors are humanitarian actors. Others are, uh, let's say, more radical actors. Over the last years, uh, we have been witnessing uh, the uh, emergence uh, of uh, the amazing transnational project of uh, Alarm Phone, a multi sided hotline employing uh, information and communication technologies to provide immediate assistance to migrants uh, in distress. Mm -hmm and the connected uh, Welcome to Europe uh, network. Well, Alarm Phone, the Welcome to Europe uh, network uh, are definitely not uh, classical humanitarian uh, actors, although uh, they cooperate uh, with uh, a panoply of uh, humanitarian actors as also Mediterranean does. For a land phone, what is really important uh, is uh, the legacy of uh, abolitionism uh, in uh, the Americas, uh, and in particular, uh, the practice, but also the means uh, of uh, the underground uh, railroad. And I'm convinced that the legacy of abolitionism, and more generally, uh, black radical thought, uh, is a crucially important archive mm -hmm. to rethink uh, uh, what uh, emerges uh, as uh, a crucial object of critical thought uh, against the background of the criminalization of humanitarian uh, intervention, which means the very question of uh, the human. At least uh, since uh, David Walker's appeal to the colored citizens of the world, 1830, the foundational text of uh, African-American political thought, the claim to be human, the simple claim to be human in front of powerful devices of dehumanization and even animalization, to uh, quote uh, M. Césaire and Franz Fanon, is a defining characteristic of uh, African American uh, thought and uh, movement. Let's take uh, seriously this question of dehumanization. Dehumanizing processes are definitely at play in borderlands and the long maritime frontiers mm -hmm. at the juncture between racism, violence, and the specter of death that often haunt 
migrant journeys since uh, their uh, inception. The human uh, appears here, uh, for instance, in the Mediterranean, in front of the risk uh, of a shipwreck or uh, interception by an actor like the so-called Libyan Coast Guard, precisely as a claim, as an uncertain and even fragile wager. To be more precise, I think it appears as a battlefield where the denial and the affirmation of the human are directly confronted and clash. Beyond the, the pitfalls of uh, humanitarianism and more generalism of uh, European humanism, mm -hmm. we should rethink the human, I think, mm -hmm. from the point of view of subjects whose uh, belonging to a shared humanity has been and continues to be contested. Mm -hmm. And we should take their uh, claims mm -hmm not only the processes of dehumanization that target them, but also their claims, their struggles, their movements as a thread to reinvent the human. So such a rethinking of the human implies that the human is always embodied. That the human can be thought of as a kind of abstract universal. And that has long been a point of disagreement with humanitarianism in my own experience. Looking at people who die or are rescued in the Mediterranean, humanitarian actors often insist that we should not call them migrants, but rather persons, an all-encompassing figure of vulnerability. But those people do not die as uh, quote and unquote persons while attempting to cross a border in the Mediterranean or elsewhere. They precisely die as migrants. They die as people with a specific skin color and gender with bodies that bear the traces of long histories of uh, racialization and colonial domination with bodies which bear the stigma of poverty. Mm -hmm. And perhaps more importantly, mm -hmm. these people are not mere victims. Mm -hmm. Their practice of freedom of movement is a political practice. Mm -hmm. We should, of course, uh, discuss about the meaning of uh, political in this case. Mm -hmm and I am happy to do that uh, later, but uh, I insist that uh, their practice, migrants and refugees uh, practice of freedom of movement uh, is a political pra practice. The stubbornness, the amazing stubbornness with which uh, they challenge the necropolitics of borders, often paying an intolerable price, should be acknowledged as the foundation of any politics of uh, migration today. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, conclude by uh, saying uh, that uh, in the past months, uh, notwithstanding uh, the pandemic and the panoply of administrative hurdles put up in particular by the Italian government, the cooperation between civil actors engaged in search and rescue operations in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. has intensified, foreshadowing the birth of 
a real civil fleet. Something else happened uh, over uh, the last months uh, in and around the Mediterranean, something that uh, I find uh, particularly interesting. I have uh, written quite uh, extensively with Brett, with Brett Nielsen, uh, about uh, the question of translating uh, movements uh, and struggles uh, from uh, one context uh, to a different one. Mm. And something like that happened in uh, the Mediterranean uh, since uh, last summer. Black Lives Matter has reached the Mediterranean. And you may find that, this, that slogan in the statements of several uh, organizations. And this is producing a further shift in the discourse of sea rescue, which is moving toward a more accurate recognition of the specific histories and conditions behind movement of migration across the Mediterranean and of the subjectivity of migrants and refugees beyond the rhetoric of vulnerability and victimization. So the next months and the years will continue to be tough in the Mediterranean. But the stubbornness of migration and the further expansion of activism at sea can build the basis for unexpected political alliances and hopefully for uh, an effective uh, transformation of uh, the border uh, really. Thank you. Hmm? It's a pity that we cannot make an applause, although I think that probably Zoom should allow, should have a new function <laughs> uh, that allows uh, for, uh, for applauses, because uh, I think this, um, this paper that you presented tonight really deserves um, a lot of applauses and more. I, I think obviously there are lots of questions, that, but I would like to start by maybe asking you a couple of questions precisely around the last issue that you raised around the issue of the human and the ways in which the human comes to be reconceptualized away from the humanitarian um, construction of the human as either a universal subject uh, which denies the history of racialization, oppression, dehumanization, and um, <clears throat> racist undertakes <clears throat> that you very well articulated. Um, and so it, it is in your talk tied to, a, to the emergence of um, a social movement or to em an emergence of a, of, a, of, a, of a community of struggle that uh, in a way takes from a variety of legacies, the abolitionist one, as you mentioned, but also uh, to an extent in the practice, at least I imagine it also draws upon um, the need, the immediate need to, um, to oppose necropolitics in the Mediterranean Sea, which, which basically means uh, that as you mentioned at the end of your talk, it, it is uh, the, the quintessential political practice of the movement is to stop death, uh, at least in the context of the Mediterranean Sea. Then, of course, you articulated um, the ways in which sort of these, these struggles bond together land and sea and, 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 and uh, of course, not only the legacies, the historical legacies, but the contemporary legacies extend beyond the actual Mediterranean and go, go back to or extend towards other uh, border regimes and border struggles such as the Mexican one. And of course, I mean, when you were talking about the, the, the whole um, idea of, um, of the Mediterranean as, um, as the new border um, of Europe, um, I could not kind of stop but thinking about another experience of um, political struggle in the sea and across the sea, which was the flotilla, um, the people trying to reach and challenge the fortification or the erection of 
a sea barrier or border um, encircling the Gaza Strip. Um, so I also wanted to kind of introduce this comparison and ask you whether there was any moment in which this legacy made um, appeared in, in the political practice of Mediterranean or it was ever discussed and so on. And, and whether actually in the practice of the, of the social movement that is being produced out of this um, political contestation of the border regime, there has been some connection with that particular historical experience of challenging borders at sea, if you wish. But basically, yeah, I would like to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more about this reconceptualization of the human that emerges in this um, uh, redefinition of humanitarianism, um, because I'm really interested in this. And, um, and so, yeah, a further elaboration on that. And also, um, I have a question around um, something that you um, said at the beginning of your talk in relation to Wendy Brown's point on borders or border regimes being a symptoms of a profound crisis of the sovereign or sovereign power. And I wanted you to, um, to elaborate more on this point in terms of giving us your own uh, political and, and intellectual understanding of what this crisis is about <laughs> and, um, and how does sort of uh, the, the, in that sense, experiences such as Mediterranean speak to uh, that crisis or speak back to that crisis. Or <clears throat> so these are some of the issues that I had in mind. I, I have, of course, lots of, I mean, I have taken lots of notes and I have lots of questions, but I um, would also like to open up uh, the, uh, Q&A to the audience. So maybe I'll ask you to not answer my question straight away, but uh, to maybe we'll collect a few. Um, I, like usual, uh, we welcome questions either by raising hands. And so, you know, you can take, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question directly. We, we can see the hands that are raised. Um, so that's a possibility. Alternatively, of course, you can post your question in the chat. There are already few questions. So while people are gathering their thoughts and finding out where the function of, of the raising hand is, if they are not yet familiar with it, I'll, I'll just read out a question that has been uh, posted on the chat um, to you, Sandra. And the question is from Laura Zuccaro, um, who um, writes, in October 2020, the Italian government made a U-turn on Salvini's approach to migration, promoting positive welcome and integration policies. What is your Professor Mezzadra or your opinion about how widespread are Salvini's views still in Italy among the electorate? And that could put pressure on the current Conte government, thus resulting in a return to less tolerant measures. Um, there is um, another question. I mean, there, as usual, this chat has become an archive itself. Sandra, it's something that you probably are very familiar with, but it's really interesting to see that in, in, in the chat. Um, I we see have, the name of uh, some dear friends uh, in the chat. Some dear friends, but also a lot of um, people exchanging views, experiences, and the materials, which is really fascinating and interesting. So I'll give actually the floor to Eugenia, who has uh, raised her hand. So um, please, Eugenia, yes. you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It was so interesting and so well put. It was just really inspiring. And you talked uh, about a lot of things. and. Um, I was interested about when you said that in the border regime and in the governance of migration, there are a lot of actors, so private and public actors. And, uh, and you also talked about externalization. I'm, I'm referring to the political, uh, to migration, European migration policies, which in the last years have uh, depended a lot on uh, externalization and externalization has been one of the main objective. Um, and so in this regard, we kind of saw um, diff a different humanitarianism. So on one hand, we have NGOs at sea, uh, which like you said, 
um, carry out political action uh, beyond, I mean, apart from saving lives, they also carry out political action. But then on the other hand, we also see a humanitarianism that is being used as a tool for externalization. So in this regard, I'm referring, for example, in the case of Libya, uh, recently there was a case of NGOs that were found, um, that were accused or at least were um, found uh, guilty let's say, of um, working uh, with the public money in uh, detention centers in Libya. Uh, so the question is, what do you think is the difference between humanitarianism at sea and humanitarianism at land, if there is, in the context of externalization? So to what extent it could possibly, it could, one could argue that humanitarianism um, at land, especially in third countries such as Libya, with NGOs operating in detention centers, uh, can be seen and can be defined as a tool of European externalization action. I'm sorry, I don't know if it was clear. It's quite complex. And so, thank you. Sandro. No, you, you need to unmute. First of all, uh, uh, stopping death is uh, uh, a radical political action today, particularly in Europe, not only in Europe, but particularly in Europe. It is uh, an action that uh, uh, has not only to do with uh, what happens uh, in the Mediterranean mm. or along the Balkan route. Mm. It is an action that intervenes in the very heart of uh, the European space. Mm. There is a, a kind of uh, impressive work of art by Arkady Zaides, which is entitled uh, Necropolis, and which shows in a very uh, effective way uh, the uh, spread of uh, the very logic of death across uh, Europe, starting from what happens uh, at uh, the borders of uh, Europe. Mm. The question of the flotilla that uh, has uh, been uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Ruba is uh, very interesting. Mm. Uh, according to my own experience, uh, uh, let's say the memory of uh, the flotilla is uh, very present in particular in Greece. And there are uh, Greek activists uh, who took part uh, in uh, the experience of the flotilla and nowadays are engaged uh, in uh, uh, rescue operations uh, at sea. So you say that uh, the experience of the flotilla is in fact uh, part uh, of uh, the uh, heterogeneous kind uh, of uh, mm, archive mm, upon which uh, mm, search and rescue operations uh, at sea uh, are uh, predicated. Mm. The question of the human uh, who uh, of course uh, uh, require uh, uh, much more time uh, to be uh, discussed uh, in depth. Mm. But let me say that uh, uh, I am convinced uh, that uh, uh, there is a need uh, uh, to uh, 
tackle again uh, the question of the, the human uh, in a situation in which uh, the um, academic debate uh, in the humanities uh, in the West uh, is uh, characterized by kind of too easy dismissal of the question of the human. Mm. We know very well uh, that uh, uh, the post-colonial, uh, the feminist, uh, uh, the anti-racist critique of uh, humanism uh, has uh, shed light of uh, kind of uh, hierarchical uh, construction of the human that uh, was uh, um, produced by uh, European uh, humanism. But I think that uh, uh, there is a need to um, reorganize uh, those uh, critiques, uh, uh, moving toward uh, a different understanding of the human. And this in particular uh, in a situation in which uh, the post-human uh, uh, is uh, shaping uh, so many uh, debates uh, in the humanities uh, uh, today. Mm -hmm. You know, Rosy Braidotti asked me, and uh, uh, Rosy Braidotti, who introduced uh, this uh, notion of the post human, uh, asked me and Brett uh, to write uh, an entry uh, on Lampedusa, the Italian island, uh, for a glossary of uh, the post human. And Brett and I uh, uh, noted in that entry. <laughs> that uh, uh, it is very common to hear migrants and uh, refugees uh, claiming uh, we are human uh, during uh, demonstrations. In a way, this idea to uh, uh, rethink the human from the point of view of uh, those people whose humanity has been and is uh, contested uh, uh, emerged precisely from uh, such uh, experiences. And I was uh, uh, very happy to see that uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in particular in the Francophone debate uh, uh, between Africans and Afro descendants, uh, such an idea is quite uh, widespread. <laughs> and needless to say, to do that uh, uh, implies uh, uh, a move away from any idea of the human uh, as uh, a given essence. <laughs> In a way, uh, such an idea of the human uh, uh, stresses the plasticity. <laughs> of the human. And from this point of view, I think uh, it is possible also uh, to uh, make bridges uh, with uh, some uh, interesting uh, recent developments uh, uh, in sciences, uh, in neuroscience, uh, for instance. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, what uh, I think uh, we should uh, quote and unquote rescue is precisely the materiality of the human, the, the materiality of passions, the, ma the materiality of desire, the materiality of pain and joy, kind of Spinozian uh, angle on the question of uh, the human. Uh, Laura uh, was uh, uh, asking about uh, the current situation uh, uh, in Italy. Mm. I wouldn't say that uh, uh, we are witnessing a U-turn in uh, migration politics in Italy. Mm. 
but uh, definitely there have been uh, some significant improvement uh, with respect uh, to uh, the, the legislation of uh, uh, the Salvini uh, era. Mm -hmm. Also to uh, answer Eugenia's uh, question, uh, uh, there would be the need uh, to um, take into account uh, uh, another dimension uh, of the problem, which means uh, the European dimension. Uh, the way in which uh, uh, the European Union uh, is trying uh, to uh, change uh, its political approach to uh, migration and borders. You may know that uh, uh, the president of the European uh, Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, presented uh, a new pact for uh, migration uh, some weeks uh, ago. Mm -hmm. and this new pact uh, uh, on migration uh, uh, is interesting, at least to me, because it uh, uh, implicitly uh, takes stock uh, of uh, the crisis of European migration and border uh, politics uh, over the last uh, five, six years, and tries uh, to uh, uh, lay the ground for the new start. From a new start, uh, uh, whose elements uh, were all present in uh, the uh, uh, European uh, uh, border regime uh, uh, before the crisis of 2015. So I'm not uh, kind of endorsing <laughs> that uh, plan, but I think it is interesting. I repeat, uh, 2015 was a turning point in uh, European migration and border uh, politics. It was a turning point precisely uh, because of what we call the long summer of migration. The fact that hundred thousand migrants were able to uh, effectively challenge the border regime in the Aegean and were able to reach the heart of Europe uh, across uh, uh, the, the uh, so-called uh, Balkan route. That was really a kind of shock in Europe. And we know that after a, a, a couple of months, <laughs> in which uh, uh, a welcoming attitude was uh, prevalent in several uh, countries, uh, from uh, Greece uh, to uh, Germany. The uh, reaction of uh, the European Union to that uh, uh, challenge was uh, uh, very weak, very, very weak. And what happened? Something uh, uh, quite uh, simple but uh, important, which means uh, uh, a process of renationalization of uh, border uh, uh, control. Mm. And it was the combined effect of the long summer of migration and this process of uh, uh, renationalization of border control uh, that uh, produced uh, a deep crisis uh, in the European uh, uh, migration and border. Uh, uh, politics. Now the uh, European Commission is trying uh, to uh, lay the ground for a new start. And which is the problem uh, behind uh, uh, the crisis? Uh, well, uh, I want uh, uh, to say it again, I, I um, quickly refer to it, uh, speaking uh, of uh, walls uh, and of the book by Wendy Brown. The problem is mobility, hmm? is mobility. <laughs> the, the, the main uh, uh, point uh, 
for a European uh, uh, border regime has never been simply stopping mobility. It has rather been an attempt to promote processes of selective and differential uh, inclusion of mobile subjects into Europe. Violent hierarchical processes, but not simply stopping mobility. So, if you read uh, the new pact for uh, migration, the paper uh, that describes the new pact, uh, you find at uh, the end uh, two pages on the need to. Uh, have again a well ordered migration. This is the phrase, you know, phrase that circulates a lot. And those two, three pages are completely neoliberal in character. Uh, the main notion is uh, uh, human capital, race for talent, this kind of stuff. But uh, uh, it was. Uh, 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 several years uh, uh, that uh, uh, the European Commission uh, uh, did not speak explicitly of the need to restart uh, uh, mobility, legal migration, mm. legal migration according to uh, very specific schemes, you know, circular mig migration, seasonal migration, temporal migration. Uh -huh point systems as uh, in the UK and so on. Mm. And this is an important uh, point, I think, uh, uh, both uh, uh, to uh, uh, speak about what is happening in Italy, what uh, the, the, the Italian government is currently doing, uh, and uh, to speak uh, about uh, 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 processes of uh, externalization mm. very, very quickly. Um, Laura was also asking about uh, uh, the uh, influence of Salvini's uh, views uh, in the Italian society nowadays. Uh, you know, uh, with the pandemic, uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, security linked with migration uh, as uh, practically disappeared from the public uh, agenda. Mm. Salvini tried mm -hmm. to uh, make it uh, again central with respect to the pandemic. You know, uh, uh, a few migrants uh, uh, arriving from the Mediterranean uh, tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, and Salvini started to say, okay, this is the threat. This is the origin of uh, uh, coronavirus. It is migration. I'm oversimplifying, of course, his argument. Uh, but it didn't work. It didn't work. And more generally, also looking at uh, movements, popular movements, uh, uh, in the peripheries of the big cities uh, where uh, racism uh, has been a problem in the last uh, years. Well, in the last months, uh, it was not uh, particularly visible. There were no uh, relevant uh, events uh, in uh, this uh, respect. This does not mean that uh, Salvini's views uh, uh, have disappeared from the Italian public opinion. This is definitely not the case, unfortunately. But in this moment, uh, uh, they are not so visible. They are not uh, at the center of uh, uh, public uh, uh, debate. Mm. Regarding uh, the question uh, of uh, mm. NGOs uh, in uh, detention centers uh, in Libya. You know, I would put it in very general terms, uh, uh, which is the way in which uh, 
we can uh, effectively act in the framework of uh, processes uh, of externalization of border control. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the usual dilemma, you know. <laughs> Detention centers in Libya, uh, you may know that, uh, are, uh, are lagger, mm -hmm. are really lagger. This is something that uh, the UN has, uh, has uh, uh, said. I mean, it's not, uh, it's out of question. Mm -hmm. They are lagger. And so you think, uh, uh, what do you do mm -hmm. as an NGO if you have uh, uh, the possibility to operate uh, in such uh, a place? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, uh, you are aware of the fact that doing that, you legitimate hmm, the existence of the place. Hmm. On the other hand, uh, you are also aware of the fact that with an NGO, with an international NGO in the detention center, huh, uh, violations of human rights uh, can be uh, at least uh, uh, reduced. And you have to negotiate this kind of uh, dilemmas. For me, the important point is uh, uh, that you never, never become completely complicit with either European or Libyan, in this case, uh, authority. You always need uh, uh, a margin of autonomy. Because if you, if you become uh, uh, entirely complicit, then you cannot do anything. Then the, 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 the governmental logic uh, uh, is the only logic uh, that uh, uh, is valid. Thank you, Sandra. We have another, we have a couple of questions. I, I also wanted to ask you again uh, to maybe elaborate a little bit upon the, the kind of relationships that are coming into being in this context of sea activism. Um, as you actually <clears throat> told us very, uh, in a very poignant way um, about how activism at sea is actually a reverberation or reverberates um, across, uh, sort of stretching beyond the sea and, 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 and feeding into a political struggle um, in, in the land. Um, and, and I couldn't help but think, uh, again, another connection to uh, think about the, one of the books I read recently, which is the last book by Isabel Allende, the last book she wrote, um, A Long Petal of the Sea, where she describes, um, of, of course, in a fictionalized way, but it's quite historically accurate, um, the rescuing um, that Pablo Neruda organizes um, of um, communist <clears throat> refugees escaping the Spanish civil war via refugee camps in France. And then she describes sort of the kind of relationships and political activism that uh, starts on the boat, on the ship itself and extends then in Chile under where these refugees find themselves fighting against the dictatorship of Pinochet and then Argentina and so on and so on. So there is another really interesting, I think, comparison there to be made about um, the connections that um, happen, not, not to mention, for example, of course, <laughs> Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic. And so I'm just wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about the kind of the every, everyday relationships and political ideologies, ideas that um, are shared and shaped uh, in the context of Mediterranean and whether um, these, uh, what you described as the overcoming of the humanitarian reason um, in, 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 in the experience of Mediterranean is um, what, 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 is it, it, what is its flesh and bones? What is it made of? Do these relationships continue? What is the movement that is behind um, the, such activism? And um, what, what makes us hopeful that it will become or expand into a political movement that contests that is wider than the actual rescuing of, of migrants and becomes a force in itself. So that, that's sort of my question that also builds on the, the previous one. Um, before I'll give you the, the, the floor, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll um, because it might be the case that there is a lot to say. So I, I would like to um, read out some of the questions that are here in the chat. So maybe you can take all of them together. 
there's a question that um, was posted about, which I think is really interesting by, I don't know whether I pronounce it correctly, but Valekos. Valekos. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I wanted to ask you if migrants are dying as migrants and not as persons, I guess as the final act of a non-wanted political action. Aren't these deaths reinforcing sovereignty of national states? And then there is a question that is uh, uh, obviously very pertinent, although it's the $1 million, million dollar question, which is about why is Europe um, allowing such suffering um, to keep these hard borders on? So maybe if you can take these three. Can you repeat um, well, it's a question that is about sort of why is this happening? Why is Europe continuing these politics of um, these necropolitics um, of literally letting people die um, or killing them <laughs> through this externalization of borders and private, um, private actors that you describe in the Mediterranean Sea, which maybe connects back to the question of what symptoms um, of which crisis are these material and immaterial borders uh, um, representative of? Well, I like very much uh, uh, your uh, reference uh, to Isabel Allende's book. I didn't read it, uh, uh, but I read a uh, book review, uh, and I was uh, very familiar uh, with the story that uh, is at the center of the book, which is a kind of amazing story. Your question about uh, uh, the uh, relations uh, uh, in um, everyday life, particularly on the ship in Mediterranean, is again a very interesting uh, question. You know, uh, the first article I wrote uh, uh, on Mediterranean newspaper article to announce uh, the uh, sailing uh, uh, of uh, our uh, boat uh, mm, on uh, mm, October 3, mm, 2018, uh, mm, concluded uh, with uh, a quotation uh, of C.L.R. James <laughs> of uh, his book uh, on Melville, where he says uh, that the ship uh, is a miniature uh, of the world uh, we live in. And I glossed uh, that uh, in our case, uh, uh, it is also a miniature uh, of the world uh, we want to build. <laughs> But it is uh, interesting uh, uh, to go back to, to C.L.R. James because uh, in that book uh, uh, he expands on uh, uh, the ship uh, as a miniature of the world, uh, uh, describing in detail uh, uh, the different uh, skills uh, that uh, are needed uh, uh, to let the ship uh, roll mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, produce a specific form uh, of uh, cooperation. Of course, we had also uh, to uh, take this aspect uh, into account, mm -hmm. to take the aspect of skills into account. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, uh, the Marignano is a tugboat. Mm. And the tugboat uh, needs uh, seven professional uh, uh, maritime uh, workers mm, to be allowed to sail. Mm. 
they were uh, only uh, 15 uh, persons allowed on board, and seven of them are, uh, were and are uh, professional uh, maritime workers. We had to recruit them. And in order to recruit them, uh, uh, the union uh, helped us. And the union uh, of uh, seafarers, maritime workers, uh, has a strong internationalist uh, uh, legacy. And this internationalist legacy is still present in the union. So this was the first level, uh, you know, cooperation. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, uh, you know, uh, we had to uh, adapt mm -hmm. the boat uh, to rescue, uh, to search and rescue operations. Mm -hmm. So the boat was uh, in a shipyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, you may imagine that uh, uh, shipyards and the maritime world in general uh, is a male dominated uh, world. Mm -hmm. Of course, we didn't want to pay too much uh, for the, uh, the work. And so there were uh, 20, 25 young activists who uh, volunteered to work on board. Most of them uh, were women. <laughs> Young women, it was summer, it was very hot in Sicily. So you can imagine uh, the gaze of uh, uh, the male workers in the shipyard. And uh, the kind of difficult situation we were confronted with. But uh, it was, uh, uh, in a way, surprisingly easy hmm, to uh, start uh, interesting conversations with those people. And the same uh, uh, was true with the professional maritime uh, workers. You know, most of them are from Sicily. They did not necessarily had, uh, have uh, a uh, positive view of uh, migrants and refugees uh, crossing the European border in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. All of them said, uh, if somebody is uh, in distress at sea, it is a duty mm -hmm. to uh, uh, help uh, him or her. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, you know, the kind of basic uh, uh, point of departure of our conversations. And again, these conversations were uh, uh, really very productive and interesting. And several of them became activists, you know. And uh, Ruba, uh, uh, you know a bit, uh, you know, <laughs> Sicily. You can imagine uh, uh, the maritime world uh, in Sicily. It is quite surprising that uh, uh, people, you know, 50, 55 years uh, became activists, mm -hmm. became really engaged uh, beyond uh, the salary that we, of course, have to pay. I mean, mm -hmm. But then, uh, uh, elaborating again on the question of uh, skills, uh, you need uh, uh, positions. Mm -hmm. You need uh, medical uh, personnel. Mm -hmm. You need also people who have a bit of experience in uh, search and rescue operations. You cannot go at sea without any kind of experience because then the risk is very, very high. Mm -hmm. So we had to, to work a lot on the composition of uh, the crew, let's say. Mm -hmm. But it was. Uh, mm -hmm a nice uh, motley uh, crew. Mm. And uh, I mean, it was very interesting uh, to, to, to work on this kind of uh, composition. In a way, at the end, uh, uh, the ship became a miniature uh, of the world uh, we want uh, to construct. Mm.
you know the question uh, of uh, uh, the deaths and uh, the reinforcement of sovereignty is of course uh, uh, crucial uh, and also difficult uh, question uh, You will definitely know that uh, uh, Michel Foucault uh, defined sovereignty uh, through the phrase, uh, uh, let people uh, live, make people die. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I don't think it is a very accurate uh, uh, description of uh, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, this uh, uh, relation between sovereignty and death uh, uh, is an important uh, uh, one. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, I would say that uh, uh, sovereignty uh, cannot be uh, simply uh, constructed upon death. Mm. Because otherwise it becomes a spectral uh, sovereignty. Mm. And again, uh, the, the, the work by Arkady Tsailas, Necropolis, that, that I was uh, mentioning before, uh, gives uh, an effective uh, representation of uh, a kind of uh, spectral uh, sovereignty, uh, representing at the same time uh, uh, sovereignty's uh, uh, subjects as uh, zombies. Uh, uh. But it is sure that uh, uh, through uh, a necropolitical border regime, uh, in Europe, uh, the European space uh, is uh, produced every day. Yeah. And the kind of uh, European uh, space uh, uh, we are currently uh, living in uh, is what uh, uh, nurtures the operations uh, of uh, a necropolitical uh, uh, border uh, uh, regime. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we look uh, at the question from the angle of life, mm -hmm. we have to ask ourselves which kind of life mm -hmm. is uh, mm -hmm. produced, uh, made possible, enabled, uh, by the operations of a necropolitical border uh, regime. And this is the reason why, uh, as I was saying before, we have to fight against this border regime, not only at the border, uh, at sea, but also uh, on uh, the land. Uh, and also the question, why, why is this happening? Uh, uh, is of course important, but uh, very, very uh, difficult because uh, uh, it uh, necessarily uh, refers to uh, questions uh, of uh, uh, global uh, justice uh, and injustice, uh, of uh, relations between uh, uh, different parts uh, of uh, the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, for me, the main point uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the, the quality hmm, you know, of life uh, hmm, within uh, the space that uh, uh, should be circumscribed by the borders uh, we are talking uh, about. Hmm. The question is, uh, uh, which are uh, the conditions uh, 
uh, for uh, uh, different politics, uh, different border politics, uh, the politics of freedom of movement uh, that uh, uh, could transform at the same time uh, the border regime and uh, the uh, uh, political space in Europe. Mm. And then uh, uh, the last qu questions uh, asked uh, by uh, Aruba, what symptoms uh, of uh, which uh, crisis? Mm. You know, uh, I think uh, to put it uh, quickly that um, such a border regime as the one I, mm, described uh, mm -hmm. is able uh, uh, to uh, produce uh, uh, what uh, uh, my friend Nicolas de Genova calls uh, the spectacle mm -hmm. of uh, an integrated uh, space. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, uh, Nowadays, uh, uh, there are other uh, spaces uh, that are uh, traversed by other forms of mobility uh, that tend to escape uh, the very possibility of control by uh, sovereignty. Uh. Over the last years, uh, I have been working very much on uh, the topic of logistics. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you may know that there is a kind of uh, lively critical debate uh, on uh, the issue of uh, logistics. Mm -hmm. What I find particularly interesting uh, in uh, such a debate uh, is uh, the attempt to map uh, uh, a logistical space uh, that does not uh, overlap uh, with the political space of uh, states. Uh, and the logistical space uh, is the space of capital. Uh, if we take seriously this point, uh, it means that uh, sovereignty uh, is not at all uh, able to uh, come to grips with the dynamics, the movements of capital. And this seems to me uh, quite, uh, a quite uh, profound transformation and uh, crisis of sovereignty. Again, the question of mobility is crucial. The mobility of staff, as uh, Deborah Cowan says. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you look at uh, uh, the way in which uh, uh, migration, it means human mobility, mm -hmm. is managed mm -hmm. nowadays in many parts of the world, mm -hmm. you will find uh, that uh, the uh, logistical rationality. Mm -hmm plays a more and more important role also in the management of human mobility. Just think of uh, the so-called hot spots that are uh, uh, widespread uh, in uh, uh, Southern Europe, in countries like Italy, Greece. Mm. Hot spot is a logistical uh, notion, of course. But okay, this would be the topic for a different kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to say that uh, uh, on the one hand, you have the spectacle of the border. On the other hand, uh, you have a complexity of movements, of dynamics uh, that um, challenges mm -hmm. the uh, grip of uh, sovereignty. Mm -hmm.
yeah, I was muted. So I, <laughs> I was just, um, I was just uh, thanking you very much for the very um, interesting answers to, to the questions that uh, obviously would raise other questions, but we, there is this painful moment where one has to decide that it's time to wrap up and to, uh, to let the speaker go, uh, although you've been very generous by responding to questions for now more than an hour. I, yeah, so basically I really want to thank you so much, Sandro, for accepting this invitation for uh, these incredibly powerful insights, for um, the really powerful message that uh, even in a seemingly humanitarian operation, there is a, a political subjectivity emerging that can bring um, wider claims to the table and can uh, become a political movement in and of itself. And I think uh, that for me was the most powerful um, message that I want to take home, especially as we are particularly interested in this question in our uh, teaching these days. Um, and the students were in the last few weeks grappling with the question of you know, the limits of humanitarian practices and what can be rescued within that in a context where the violence of the border regime is so um, heightened and, uh, and the rise of um, the numbers of uh, people dying at the border or across the desert is um, on the rise in, in, in such a clear and horrible way. So um, the question of how to navigate the, the impellent need to impede these deaths while not abandoning the political project or the political ideal of transformation of society is, is I think a crucial one, which I think is, is very um, powerfully um, discussed in your talk and in your article as well, and in your wider work. So I wanted to really thank you very much because you spoke to some very impellent kind of and important questions that we are grappling with um, in this in these last few weeks. And um, I'm sure I am also interpreting the feelings of all the uh, members of the audience tonight in wanting to thank you and hoping to have you as guests again in the next future. Uh, sorry for those who have asked questions that couldn't be answered, uh, but I'm sure that um, Sandra is going to be very happy to answer those over email, <laughs> or maybe even better, just read the very important and powerful work um, that Sandra has produced over the last years. And most of the answers will be in those, um, in those um, really important works. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, as I announced last week, this is the last of um, the talks for this term and we are resuming the series next uh, with the 2021 next year. So Hassan Haj's um, talk will be is, is, is postponed to January 21 and we will be more precise about when exactly in the next couple of days. Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all for, for tonight. Um, thank you Kim for organizing everything and uh, we'll see you again in the new year. Um, thank if you, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duba, and thank you, participants. Ciao. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you so much. So I was just going to say thank that you, very much. you will receive information about the next seminars, um, which will take place from January to March, as you have registered into this uh, seminar tonight. So if you're interested, um, just register for the next ones as well. And um, yeah, Kim, I don't know whether you wanted to say something. Yeah, or... uh, we'll be sending around um, the recordings um, as per usual, but they'll also be um, up on the um, Migration and Diaspora Facebook group. Um, and then, yeah, so I will be sending a follow up email uh, with the new dates of the next seminar series. Um, obviously, if you don't want to receive any of those emails, all you um, need to do is just email me back and let me know and I can definitely take you off of um, the mailing list. Um, but it's just helpful to know what other sessions are coming up um, in the next uh, in the next term. Brilliant. Thank you, Kim. Um, and so this is now really the time to say goodbye to everyone. And uh, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.